profound questions of existence are future generations, high-end vehicles and cameras. So what else do we have left? We'll get to hear about how they are searching for the cure for the cancer. So from quantitative imaging systems, let's welcome physicist Michelle Nederloff. Give a round of applause for Michelle Nederlof, Quantitative Imaging Systems. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to tell you about what we do with uh, QT in our fight against cancer. Uh, QI Tissue is uh, our software product with, with QT, and uh, we didn't do that alone. We are in uh, close collaboration with a, a group at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon, and on the software side with uh, KDAP uh, that you well know. So what do we know about cancer? I know this audience is primarily filled with software engineers, and most of you do uh, uh, car dashboards. So this is what we know about cancer. Um, basically, it's a very large part list, but we have very little idea of how these parts actually are being put together to form a working car. We know spots of information, like if we press the gas pedal, the car will go faster. But we really don't have all the clues as to how that is all connected and how that spatially is organized in cells and tissues. Um, so what is the part list of, uh, of a human cell? First of all, uh, there are three million base par pairs that uh, build up DNA molecules. And uh, there are 23 of those DNA molecules in a human cell. Uh, that uh, translates into about 20,000 different genes. And uh, those genes are used to uh, read out and build the individual proteins that uh, determine the cell uh, functionality. And uh, there are about 10 million of those. So um, we have the actual uh, map of these uh, DNA molecules. We did a human genome project to exactly know every molecule in, uh, in our human DNA. And uh, we can print that out. It'll be a stack of paper about 100 meters high. And uh, from there, we could actually uh, derive how, uh, how we um, work, how cells work, how tissues work, and what could go wrong. However, it's more complicated than that. We are considerably more complicated uh, than that Volkswagen. Um, for example, uh, the, the challenge here is if you've worked with a very old code base uh, that may be 10 years old or 20 years old, it's quite difficult to find the old code from the new code and what's important and what's not important. So remarkably, only 1% of the DNA is actually used to read out and uh, create those amino acids and proteins. Uh, the other 99% may be old material that is there for evolutionary reasons, <clears throat> and we have a 6 million uh, uh, time span of old code that is uh, in human uh, DNA. So this is a rather old code base, so there might be some dead code in there, but we don't know which one is the dead code, and we don't know what's the real code. So. <clears throat> so uh, I'll, I'll uh, refer to a few programming analogs here. Um, so the programming language that we have in cells is different. There's no QML spoken here. We have uh, individual molecules, and we have, <clears throat> for example, uh, chemical reactions that actually uh, form the programming language of these cells. And they're proteins, transcription factors, signaling pathways. Uh, they essentially work the same as a computer program because you could think of a chemical reaction as a line of code, and uh, there are different variables that play and interact in uh, forming these signaling pathways that are essentially the programs that, that run this cell. So what goes wrong in disease? Well, it's really not uh, that wrong. Uh, it is actually a fully functional pathway. It just happens to do the wrong thing. So it's basically that uh, the wrong program is running, and the cell is uh, exhibiting malignant functions instead of benign functions. And so malignancy in, uh, in cells, human cells, is uh, uh, considered uh, uh, by a number of uh, hallmarks, and the hallmarks are that it will stimulate its own growth instead of uh, doing its normal <coughs> function. It uh, resists signals from the outside. It's uh, resisting signals that it's doing a bad thing and it should really be uh, committing suicide or apoptosis in cell language. Uh, so it's resisting cell death. It's uh, replicating indefinitely. 
and uh, it is very good at uh, actually what it's doing because it can create its own uh, supply of energy and nutrients and uh, then to make it worse, it, it starts to <laughs> metastasize and go somewhere else and uh, form a new colony and do, do the same thing. Uh, so they're rather uh, uh, unpleasant uh, characters and uh, if you think of it, you, you can find individuals that actually uh, are full uh, sized organisms that exert the exact same behavior. So uh, we can see what we can do about that. How can we fix that? Uh, well, if you know that you have all these, uh, let's see, stair pointer. <laughs> Uh, if you know that you have all these individual players and they all form an uh, important link in this program in executing uh, the different steps that are needing, needed for the uh, healthy cell to perform its function or the unhealthy cell to be malignant, then you could find druggable targets and interrupt that program at any line of the, of the code, any reaction that's there, whether it's at the DNA level, at the readout level, at the messenger RNA level, or at the uh, receptor uh, level on the outside of the cell. So if we can find a druggable target, then we can block that pathway, and then we can invoke uh, eventually cell death. So if you put the drug on the receptor, the entire program is stopped. So it is essentially like introducing a null pointer in your uh, computer program. Program will crash, and then the cell dies, so you're done. Uh, so that's nice. So if you say, well, if you can do that, then we have all these druggable targets, then why doesn't that work? So unfortunately, cells are pretty smart. They are going to actually resist the uh, treatment, uh, either quickly or over time and uh, what happens is that they simply find another pathway to do the same thing. So they find a new receptor, find an, a, a detour, and um, are going to recur with the same malignancy that they had before. And that's essentially the program taking it out of branch point. It just goes around and does something else, and it, it runs again, uh, but in a malignant way. So how can we see and measure and analyze and control uh, all of that? This is difficult because it's obviously too small to even see. So uh, 1657, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek invented a light microscope so we could even see cell and cells and start the field of uh, light microscopy and biology associated with that. 1951, uh, uh, fluorescent antibodies were developed that allow you to actually label those individual uh, molecules, the individual proteins that are in the cell, and be able to uh, uh, take a microscopy image where the individual molecules light up like a fluorescent uh, tag. And uh, the electron microscopy technology that was developed in the 30s uh, already was able to give much higher resolution and give us these precise snapshots of individual components, cellular constituents of the cell and, uh, uh, and later on actual molecules. So what we have is a uh, continuum of scales where we can study cancer at uh, the level of um, uh, organs, at the level of individual tissues and how cells interact with each other, how tumors uh, metastasize, um, as well as uh, going down to super resolution um, res um, microscopy to see the individual molecules and how they communicate <clears throat> with uh, uh, neighboring cells. And then we can go down with the electron microscope and actually see uh, the specific molecular interactions that are uh, providing these signals uh, from neighboring cells. And that's what you see in the picture on the left. So what we would like to do is, of course, uh, end cancer the way we know it. And the question is, why is that uh, so difficult? And uh, what are we doing to um, uh, succeed in this? So the difficulty is that uh, is cancer is not a single disease. There's probably 100 different forms of breast cancer and 100 different forms of uh, prostate cancer. So we have to better differentiate specific types of cancers in order to better treat them. Uh, we have to better understand what actually happens in these processes because we need to put those parts together uh, in order to find those druggable targets. And uh, in, do in uh, doing so, uh, we will learn the spatial architecture and be able to find those druggable targets to get treatments that are more durable and uh, that are properly uh, designed for individual patients. So more personalized treatment plans. 
And um, unfortunately, when we develop new drugs, nine out of 10 drugs tend to fail before they're even released. So we need to actually uh, make sure that we design drugs that are specific to a particular kind of cancer and specific to a particular patient. Uh, and uh, uh, together, they can uh, 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 deliver cures for um, uh, a myriad of uh, patients. And uh, the last line is where you come in because this can actually be cured by software engineers. So there is a plethora of new instruments and software and reagents uh, needed to achieve this. So that's what we do. And uh, QI Tissue is a program that's with an MQT desktop program that also runs on uh, servers and clusters uh, to analyze the wealth of information that comes from these different resolution levels of microscopy. Um, one thing that we do specifically is we are able to label many, many colors uh, on the same sample. So we're actually able to attach fluorescent dyes not just on three or four of those uh, uh, proteins that are in the cell, but actually to a uh, hundred different ones. And uh, then uh, we don't just create pretty pictures, but we actually go in and do measurements on the individual cells. So there's automated scene segmentation, finds the cells, and uh, measures about a hundred different features per cell. And then we can go in and explore this 800-dimensional um, <clears throat> feature space for millions of cells in a piece of tissue and uh, understand the relationship between different cells, how they progress in uh, tumor formation, how metastasis occurs, and um, uh, what the specific molecular interactions are between those cells that cause that. And eventually, uh, we should be able to uh, uh, find the druggable targets so that we can uh, cure individual patients. We go into statistical analysis of those uh, uh, cell data spaces, uh, do cluster analysis, uh, we um, uh, do deep learning, uh, we do pattern recognition. Uh, there's a number of statistical methods to reduce the dimensionality of such a data set and be guided to locations where the cell is not behaving uh, you would expect it to behave or where particular uh, portions of the tissue are uh, becoming malignant. And so we can generate these type of images that are 60 to 100 different uh, color channels. And uh, we can flip through the individual color channels and just observe. We can get the measurements as a combination uh, display where we can not only look at these pretty pictures, uh, but actually see the uh, quantitative differences. And then we can uh, use visualization methods with the Q3D technology to actually go through and uh, create a three-dimensional world of the cell architecture and take those data points that allow us to, uh, in this case, for example, highlight in yellow and lighting up uh, KI67 biomarkers. That is a malignancy proliferation marker that shows you how malignant the cell is in, uh, in uh, uh, replicating. And <clears throat> the KI67 is the yellow light up. The green height indicator is a, a cytokeratin marker that will show us what the specific differentiation is between luminal and basal cells. And uh, as a cancer progresses, these things change, and we need to know where they change. We need to guide the researchers to those locations that are anomalies, and uh, we need to be able to do that quickly and efficiently, and uh, that's basically where we need this software environment, much like we need an IDE and uh, software development to be able to debug our code and see the individual variables. We need to do the same thing and be able to put this type of car back together and know where all the parts go and uh, create the treatments from there. So acknowledgments. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people, of course, that worked on this, uh, and uh, there's a booth at the um, lower floor where there's a demo of the 3D viewer, and at the KDAP booth, you can come and visit, uh, visit me, and uh, we can talk more if you have more interest. And we're also hiring, so uh, do come by if you're interested in working on this. <laughs> uh, finally, acknowledgments to uh, uh, OHSU. Uh, Joe Gray is the visionary leader that uh, is the group at OHSU. Um, <clears throat> um, primary investigator, and uh, Phil Knight, the Nike founder who donated an enormous amount of money to OHSU to make this happen, and National Cancer Institute for uh, funding our uh, research projects. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I'll let you go. Yeah. All right, wow, that's impressive. So as you see, the importance of user experience and being able to augment things from visualization is actually more important than ever before. So like Juha mentioned, the desktop side is still at the very core of Qt and, and being able to create effective and usable interfaces. And to talk more about that, I'll actually introduce our next speaker. Thank so you. thank you, Michelle, once again. So, um, okay, yeah, let's go. The guy's curing cancer. Right.